right. Rock, and we are live, everybody. So welcome to Perspectives in Primary Care. Um, this week's episode, we are talking about how COVID-19 has added yet another chapter in the age-long discussion of health care disparities. Welcome again. Again, I'm Dr. Kadisha, your board certified emergency medicine physician, and I'm with Dr. Diedrich, who is America's relaxation doctor, and Dr. Carol, who is the master of meditation, mindset, and movement, hashtag meditation nation. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> so, so just to set the stage, COVID-19 has given us even more clarity about our, societal's, our society's racial inequities. How? By the intersection of this virus with health disparities, population density, and socioeconomic status. So that's what we're here to discuss with you tonight. So, and let me just say, while we are three seasoned physicians, one ER physician and two primary care physicians, we do state that we are not Dr. Fauci, we are not infectious disease specialists. However, we are physicians on the front lines, laying hands on patients, testing them, and treating them if they are COVID positive. And we are physicians who are closely following the developments of this pandemic in the US. So, the term healthcare disparities has been thrown around heavily since it came out that Blacks are dying at a disproportionate rate to their presence in the population. So I want to give a definition of what health disparities is. So health disparities, this is one definition, are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence or opportunities to achieve optimal health experienced by socially, economically, and environmentally disadvantaged populations. And these differences adversely affect them and are in this case historically linked to discrimination and exclusion. So with that done, let us start with the discussion of the health disparities in the rural environment with Dr. Dietrich. Hey, good evening, everybody. Yes, I'm Dr. Dietrich. And I'm gonna be talking about healthcare in the rural setting, the disparities in the rural health setting. Now, I'm a little bit different. I do practice in a rural community. I'm actually in a small West Texas town and the population is a little bit under 10,000 people. We're growing a little bit, but we're right at 10,000 people. I know there's some towns that are a little bit smaller and my population is probably around 80% Hispanic, um, about 15% white and about 5% black. So give or take a couple of, you know, percentages, but it's definitely predominantly Hispanic. And, you know, of course, all in America, different rural health, uh, rural communities make up different populations, different ethnicities, religions, and all that stuff. Um, but so when tonight I'm going to be talking, it'll be more so generalizations of the rural, rural communities. But if I talk about exactly where I am, I'll definitely, you know, make that differentiation and let you know. Okay. So I'll just first start off by saying, well, you know, what is rural? Okay. So um, some people may think rural just means, you know, farming chickens and stuff like that. Or it technically can be, but it's not the whole all encompassing um, definition of rural, right? <laughs> I thought it was that before. So, but the actual definition is pretty diverse. It's actually, I didn't really realize that. And our federal government actually classifies areas of uh, population for statistical purposes, programming and funding. So that's how they come up with their definition. But like, if you look at the, the U.S. Census, the, the definition of rural is basically uh, any population, housing or territory that's not in an urban setting. 
Okay, so it's kind of broad, it's kind of different, but that's basically what, what um, the definition is. Now, rural health, now rural health in the medical sense, uh, rural health, rural medicine, um, it's more of an interdisciplinary study of health, okay? Um, it's in the uh, non-urban environments. And so it's providing health care in these um, rural areas, okay? Now, just being in a rural community in general, um, there's some advantages and disadvantages, okay? Um, we're not just, you know, totally, you know, out there, but, you know, a lot of us are, I'm just putting it out there. Um, it, one of the advantages are um, we're typically in a, a quiet setting, more quiet, more peaceful, not so hectic, not a whole lot of traffic going on. It's a little bit slower pace in general. Um, you get to actually know your neighbors a little bit more. Um, you don't really have to travel too far for some of the basic essentials. They're really close. Like where I live, everything is five minutes away, literally. I mean, here to there, five minutes away. Okay. Um, there's more open wide spaces though as well in a rural setting and we're uh, we're more a little bit more spread out. Now some of the disadvantages actually are uh, like in the advantages you get to know your neighbors a little bit more. <laughs> so you might not want to know. <laughs> you know anyhow because yeah, you know you're a small community right <laughs> um you actually might have to travel further away to get more of the other amenities that aren't offered in a rural uh, setting um like entertainment restaurants um that kind of stuff a lot of those things aren't or there's not many of them in the rural community okay um yeah. we're more geographically isolated so in our situation it may be miles and miles even for some people, a hundred of miles from the next bigger city to do things. So we're more isolated that way. And typically there's really no like public transportation. It's, you know, your car or your bike or, you know, somebody give you a lift, that kind of thing. Um, some towns like ours, we might have a, a service to help people get to appointments and whatnot, but I don't know if that's the, the norm everywhere. All right. So being in a rural setting, you know, obviously can set us up for some disparities, all right? Um, and the biggest is being access to health care, but I'll talk about that in a second. But contributing to a lack of access to health care, there's other factors as well, um, including this geographic um, isolation, not living close to a health care facility, all right? Um, there's actually lower social economic status, economic status. Um, limited job opportunities, being in smaller areas, there may be less opportunities for employment. Um, some people may even have to travel outside of the, their rural community uh, for work every day. They have to make like a long commute. Um, there's uh, actually a higher rates of low to moderate income. Um, of course, there are some more affluent people, but by far it's more of the, the lower to moderate income. Um, and this is actually all intensified uh, by uh, uh, employer, employ, people who are employed, uh, they might not have all the health insurance coverage that they may need because they don't have the, the jobs and whatnot. Um, and some of them may or may not be covered by Medicaid, okay? Um, overall, in general, um, generally speaking, there might be less education involved, okay? Um, and there's actually higher rates of risk-taking behaviors such as uh, tobacco use and alcohol, okay? Um, probably even drugs as well, okay? And then generally, the, there's a higher all-cause mortality rate as compared to urban setting, okay? Um, one other thing that's interesting, there's um, a higher proportion of elderly and younger uh, children in the rural health setting, or in the rural setting. Okay, so now getting back to access. Um, and again, I'm talking in general, um, it's not necessarily specific to my town, but there's definitely some challenges and some disparities that occur in a rural setting, okay? So some rural settings don't even have a hospital at all, all right? Some only have clinics. Um, some have areas that there may not have a physician there. There may be a nurse practitioner staffing it. They may need to call the uh, physician. Um, I know in my state, we there has to be a, a physician quote, overseeing a nurse practitioner to practice, even though they might not be, you know, in the exact same building. Um, so that can uh, possibly pre present some type of a, a challenge. Um, some rural health uh, areas don't do obstetrics, all right? Um, and if they do, they may not be able to do high risk. 
So like if there's like some type of emergency or whatnot, they'll have to be rapidly transported. Um, specialists typically don't set up house in a rural community. They may come to the community once or twice a month, uh, like cardiology, you know, just different specialized um, uh, 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 physicians. Um, testing, imaging that may not not be able to get done um, in a rural health setting that is more uh, detailed. Um, we might have just basic x-rays and whatnot, but if we need more uh, extensive testing that may not be available in a, a rural setting, all right? Um, and as a result, if someone presents like to the clinic um, urgently and they need something done, it's, sometimes it's a bear trying to get that stuff set up because um, we may end up having to send them to the ER to you know, get things done um, urgently and be uh, transferred out. Um, some places may have mobile imaging that comes a couple times a month, you know, like MRIs and whatnot. We don't have that just like right here sitting with us. And um, in the hospital setting, these hospitals may not have like an ICU, or if they do, it's like one or two beds. All right, and you know, these beds might not be used all the time, so it's not that we're just doing ICU all the time. All right. That's all pills in comparison staffing. That's a whole nother, you know, you know, ball of wax. So some people might not find being in a rural setting as desirable as being in a, a bigger city because of the different amenities. And so sometimes staffing can be a challenge with the nurses, you know, just anybody coming to work in a, a rural setting. So that could be a challenge. And, you know, if you really want to talk about it, some of these rural health hospitals are really struggling and some of them are actually being shut down or on the verge of shutting down due to money, all right? And so where are these people going to go, right? And so you can see how this kind of can tie into COVID-19 right now. Where are these people going to go if there's no place to go, you know? And if they have to travel so far far away for even just basic health care. And so um, in my research for COVID-19, um, oh, in these rural health settings, oh, um, some of these articles that um, I was saying that uh, they were saying that um, the COVID really isn't hitting rural America is, is hard. These are some earlier uh, <laughs> these are some earlier studies that I was looking at, but this could be setting people up for a false sense of security in this in the rural community. I mean, we we may have a couple of cases here and there, but like right before I you know was uh, get ready to go on this live stream, I looked up an article. And it was actually in the New York Times dated April 10th. And the title is actually, uh, Coronavirus was slow to spread in rural America, but not anymore. Mm. So I'll just really quickly read this, and I know I'm almost done. Um, a new wave of coronavirus cases is spreading deep into the rural corners of the country where people once hoped their communities might be shielded because of their isolation from the hard hit urban areas. Um, and they were getting a false sense of security because of the uh, uh, being uh, spread apart from other bigger communities. And the coronavirus has officially reached nearly three quarters of the country's rural counties with one in seven reporting at least one death. Doctors and elected officials are warning that a late arriving wave of illness could overwhelm rural communities that are older, poor, and sicker than much of the country and already dangerously short on medical help. All right, and so just going back to my community real quickly, I do see people, you know, walking around without masks on. I see um, in the stores, I have my mask on, but like the, the clerks don't have masks on, people shopping don't have masks on. And, you know, even at one point before it got really bad, people were out in the park, you know, just everybody having a good time, acting like things were normal, but things really aren't normal, right? We're definitely in a different time. And so, you know, looking on TV and stuff, you see how things are heavily populated on the, the East Coast, heavily populated on the West Coast, and a little bit like in, in Dallas and the bigger cities, but in these, the middle America is not as prevalent, but just don't be fooled by that because there's, some people are actually predicting that Corona is going to hit us hard. And the bad part is for rural America is that we're already so small, we can easily get overwhelmed, especially like with supplies and equipment and staffing. All right. And we don't have specialists, you know, that are just readily available for us. 
And um, I know in my town, we're definitely taking measures um, at our place for screening people who are even coming to the clinic, coming into the hospital, limiting visitors and whatnot. But the biggest thing that everyone is always stressing is hand washing and social isolation and social distancing just don't just don't take it for granted that we don't have a lot of cases in the rural setting. All right, and so having said that, we're gonna move our discussion to more of a, a bigger area, which Dr. Carol lives in, in New Jersey, and she has more of a diverse population as well. And she's gonna uh, talk about that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Well, thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dr. Dietrich. So we're going to move into small town America. I'm from a community in Monmouth County, New Jersey called Red Bank, New Jersey. Our population is a little larger than 12,000. So, and, and the city itself is about one by one mile square. So it's not a very large geographical area, but it is, it's dense because of that. And coronavirus has hit this county pretty hard. We have 4,000 confirmed cases and 145 deaths to date. In the state of New Jersey, we have um, 2,800 um, 2,800 deaths. So it's it's been it's been pretty hard hit here for sure. And um, our governor's been doing a great job. But we are talking about healthcare disparities and how these healthcare uh, disparities show up. And I'm going to be taking some of my information and data from the National Medical Association and a press release that was released on April 7th. So I'm going to mention something that tiptoes over into Dr. Khadija's area just a little bit because I'm going to quote a statistic from a city just to show how these healthcare disparities um, are impacting the African America and Latina communities at a disproportionate level. So in Chicago, Illinois, over 70% of those who have died are African American, but are only 30% of the city's population according to recent data from the city. We are dying at seven times the rates of others in Chicago. Now, when we look at a small town like Red Bank, we can see something similar reflected. So our white population is about 68%. Our other population is 18%. And our black population is 9%. Yet, Smallest the number, but when we look at the mortality and morbidity, the numbers flip. So there in the smaller segment of the population, you have the highest rates of disease burden and mortality and morbidity. And that's reflected in larger urban areas like Chicago. And I have to bring up Ch Chicago because my son lives in Chicago. So, you know, my mama's eye is keeping an eye on those statistics as well. And one of the things we, we look at you know, why is this so? How did we get here? Why is this a concern? And I say that tonight's show and tonight's information is important to every single American, regardless of how you identify race-wise or ethnicity, because this is impacting everyone and we have to care about the people that it impacts the most regardless of the color of their skin or their last name or the accent that they might be speaking with because it's going to continue this is one of these things this is why it got to be a pandemic it's going to continue to circle back so every single american needs to have an understanding of this information and these words of healthcare disparity need to come alive in a place in your heart so that we could choose to be better, we could choose to do something about them, and we can really flatten the curve by making sure that every aspect 
of the American population is attended to, right. particularly those that are unseen and unheard and sometimes hidden from the, the bigger picture. And so that certainly goes for our sisters and brothers in rural America and in small town America where I am. So when I go about my town, what am I seeing? I am seeing a lot of people wearing face masks because in part because of our proximity to New York City. We're 50 miles southeast of New York City and a lot of people that live and work in my county don't just live here. They live here, but they work in New York City. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of commuting back and forth and we see you know, the spikes in our numbers and in our hospitals. Mm -hmm. We're definitely stressed in our local hospitals in terms of not having enough equipment, not having enough testing. Um, we're seeing most of the population is being mindful and cooperating by wearing masks. Uh, we're certainly seeing this with the grocery stores where they've marked distances off of six feet. They've now put plexiglass or sheets of plastic up uh, when you go to purchase your food items and what have you. So we are taking it seriously in this. Oh, hello, Alicia. My, a dear friend who lives in Monmouth County is tuning in and joining the show tonight. And so we're really seeing how this is impacting these small communities along the shore. And when we look at this, we have to consider, you know, what are some of the historic roots for these healthcare disparities? This isn't something that's new. This is something that's being brought up again in light of the disproportionate numbers that we are seeing in the Black and Latino communities. So for example, this has long been a part of the healthcare disparity conversation. Black patients are less likely to receive pain treatment. Black patients are less likely to, re to, re to receive potentially life-saving uh, cancer surgery or cholesterol lower lowering drugs such as Lipitor and Crestor compared with white patients. And this has complicated roots, including explicit racism, access to healthcare problems, lack of insurance, mistrust of the medical system, cultural misunderstandings, or unconscious bias that doctors may not even know that we have. And again, this is all well documented and it's being exacerbated by the extremes of this situation. So one of the things that I do want to add and bring to everyone's attention is the reminder of the social determinants of health. And there are six social determinants of health. And this affects you regardless of race. It disproportionately shows up in the African-American communities and in the Latina communities because of history, and then also because of what's going on in the modern day with these social determinants of health. So the six categories are economic stability. Well, if you have economic stability, you might have a job where they can assign you to work from home, where you're going to be working on your, your tablets and your computers. Well, however, if you work in the sector of the society that doesn't have this economic stability, a job with benefits or um, a job that doesn't, that isn't considered essential. So perhaps you're the cleaning man or woman, perhaps you're a restaurant worker. And if you don't show up for work, you don't get paid. You don't get paid, you don't eat, you don't eat, your family doesn't eat. So you're forced to leave your home to go out and be in the public that's gonna make you more likely exposed. And that has to do with that economic stability, right? Physical environment. Well, if you live in a large house in Rumson, New Jersey, which has some of the richest persons in the United States, you might have a whole wing 
of a mansion to go socially isolated or self-quarantine in your house if you have the virus. Well, there are many, many who live in two bedroom apartments that have six people living in them. Where do they go to socially isolate or quarantine? And then we have education, we have food community, social content, and healthcare systems. So these are the social determinants of health. So I just wanted to bring that to people's attention because awareness is the beginning of change. And I, for one, as we go through this pandemic, would like to see us come out on the other side of it, more globally aware, more inclusive as a society, and able to, to move forward thinking about the entire structure, not just pockets or silos, right. but really so we kind of erase all or minimize these disparities and really look at them. And that's the America that I'll be proud of. And that's the America that I want to participate in and also be responsible for co-creating. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Khadija, who's going to take us into urban life and urban disparities. Thank you so much, Dr. Carolyn. Thanks for going over those social determinants of health as well. So uh, just to define what uh, urban might be. Uh, so urban is like a large area that is densely populated. And typically uh, they like to say it's at least 10,000 people per square mile. And according to the US 2010 census, because you know the census is going on right now, 80% right. of the US population lives in urban areas. So. We've got about 308 million people living in the US and we've got 249 million, uh, 250,000 of them living in the cities. And we know that, um, you know, uh, and New York City is at the top of uh, any graph that is discussing population density. And right now they've got about 94.1 deaths per 100,000 people. Uh, New Orleans has uh, about 70.6 per 100,000 people. Right now, the last figure I saw was 1,103 deaths with blacks accounting for 70% of those deaths while only being 30% of the population. And then here in Houston, uh, where we've got uh, 6.4 million people, uh, about 22.5% of the population is black, but we account for 54% of the the 26 deaths that we have in in Houston. We have about uh, 2,330 2, cases right now. Wow. So there are certain things that um, contribute to the health disparities, but then there's also, um, and I, I like to take it uh, and break it up into uh, different sections. So, um, so like Dr. Carol mentioned, you know, there's lack of access to proper education. Uh, citizens might not be getting the information or not getting it in their language from sources that they trust. So there could be that issue. Also, the, and then mixed in with that are still the conceptions about uh, drinking warm water to flush out the coronavirus um, and uh, things like that. I think that's that's the last one that I've heard that's like holding on. That's the last one, uh, mm -hmm. the last misconception. And then regarding social distancing, you know, we, again, we're densely populated uh, and it doesn't matter, like Dr. Carroll said, it doesn't matter what socioeconomic class you're in. Uh, the wealth that you're living in high rises, it's hard to get on an elevator by yourself. Um, so it, does, it doesn't matter. So imagine living in, a, in an apartment, like a one or two bedroom apartment, and there's four people in there, two people sleeping in the bedroom and two people sleeping on a pullout sofa in the living room. Uh, you know, these people are caring for, uh, you know, extended family. There's elderly in there also. And the COVID guidelines say 
uh, to dedicate, if someone is sick, if someone has COVID, dedicate one bedroom and a bathroom to that ill person. How could you, how could you possibly do that in the average apartment with, um, you know, with, with multiple people living in there? So it's just, it's just not practical. And that's one thing that can lead to, to spread. Um, social distancing at work. Again, many are essential workers. Uh, they're working in healthcare. Houston has uh, the largest hospital community in the world. A lot of us work in the medical center or at different hospitals around town. So the hospitals are major employers. So there are tons of people who are working in environmental services, like janitorial services. Then, you know, we're still going to the supermarkets. And so they don't have the choice or luxury of working from home, excuse me, or having groceries delivered because often these people rely on public transportation. The train still runs. People are still on those trains. And even when it comes to food, Again, so, um, you know, we just, depending on the area that you live in, you might not have access to the best food. Some of us live in food deserts and mm -hmm. food deserts are described as geographic areas where uh, the residents access to affordable, healthy food options, especially fresh fruits and vegetables, which we all know are the best things to boost our immunity system, which is crucial in fighting a COVID infection uh, is restricted, Ac access is restricted or non-existent due to the absence of grocery stores within um, a convenient traveling distance. So then we have the underlying conditions that complicate COVID infections. And these conditions, uh, diabetes, lung disease, heart disease, they, it, they disproportionately affect the black and Latino populations, meaning that there's a higher prevalence among the black and brown and a poorer outcome. And these conditions complicate COVID infections. Uh, and if, you, you know, if you're a smoker, a, a lot of people are smokers, they're living in you know, packed areas. There's the secondhand smoke. You have a lot of children who come in with asthma or ear and upper respiratory infections and their parents smoke and they don't seem to understand that uh, because you open, uh, because you uh, smoke on the porch or say you do have a car, you smoke with the window open, they're still affected. I can smell that you smoke. I knew that you were smoking you know, before I even asked. So if, if, a, if someone can smell that you smoke without even asking you or know that you smoke by the smell, that's called third hand smoke. So you don't even have to smoke and then you can spread that to someone else and, and cause asthma, an underlying condition, again, that uh, complicates COVID infections. And then there is that distrust of doctors and believe me in the ER where we get people in there who don't wanna, who aren't, who we're not planning to see a doctor today uh, you know, we get the brunt of that distrust, uh, the, you know, sometimes the anger and, um, and that leads to people avoiding medical care unless they absolutely need to get it. And that leads to their conditions, these underlying conditions becoming more serious. And so they wait till the last minute till they really, really hurt. And exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, or they can't, they can't breathe. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so there's the distrust and there's the fear. So, um, and so what am I seeing? I am seeing more people in masks uh, like Dr. Carroll. And I think Dr. Dietrich, you had mentioned to me before you even see plexiglass in your local grocery stores. Is I see a plexiglass, but unfortunately I don't see a lot of people wearing masks. I just don't see it, not yet. I mean, right. people who are working at the hospital, we know too, we doing it, but mm-mm. Right, so we're seeing more plexiglass. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing it at the uh, the post office. Those mm -hmm. uh, signs on the floor, like Dr. Carol mentioned in her area, I'm seeing those at the grocery store and uh, the post office. A lot of restaurants don't even allow you inside anymore. They're doing right. um, curbside delivery. Um, you're just not allowed. So, uh, so what is 
the the antidote to this? Uh, what you know? Where are we trying to? What are we trying to achieve by this with this discussion and pointing things out? Um, so and I'll just tell you. So one more thing. So Houston is trying to address things by increasing testing. They're trying to. Um, they're they've used a couple hotels, some abandoned hotels or ones that are closed rather to house patients uh, who have COVID if necessary. And uh, other cities are doing that too. They're taking hotels and using them to house patients uh, in case they cannot socially distance within the house or where they live or apartment. So uh, things, are being, things are being done. Uh, I think we mentioned on the last episode, Portable, I'm seeing more portable hand washing stations yeah. at the parks and things like that. And, um, you know, other cities are putting them outside of pharmacies where they know sick people are going. Mm -hmm. uh, so, mm -hmm. so, so things are coming into play and with the, um, with the goal of health equity. So we've talked about health disparities, but the antidote is health equity, which is the principle underlying a commitment to reduce and ultimately eliminate disparities in health. Its pursuit means striving for the highest possible standard of health for all people and giving special attention to those needs of the people at greatest risk because of um, the greatest risk of poor health based on social conditions. So, and the resources um, that we need are uh, to be healthy include not only quality medical care, but also education and health promoting physical and social conditions in homes, neighborhoods, and uh, workplaces. And of course, you know, there's a lot of you know policy that needs to be done, which is beyond the scope of this uh, beyond the scope of this discussion. So that's the end of. Uh, what I've seen in the in the big city, and let's see, do we we've got some folks in the comments here? Um, let's see, Marlene. Hey, that's my mom. Hey, mom. And, and uh, Emmanuel, thanks for thanks for coming in. Now, and ladies, do you guys have anything else that you'd like to add? Yeah, I just really wanted to say, going back to the uh, rural health. Um, health in rural setting too, um, just to really kind of reiterate for people, just don't take it for granted that we're not hit yet, you know, that we're not hit. Um, you, we have to prepare as if it's coming um, and just don't be fooled by the low numbers at this time. So just take it seriously and you don't want it to be your family member or you to get hit really bad, you know, for you to take action. So heed the warnings of what's going on in the country right now and, you know, just prepare yourself as best as you can, but don't just blow it off because we don't have the high numbers yet. Okay. Yes, it's a, it's a very, very important that people in the rural community really get the message because if it does hit you, it's going to hit you very hard. Very hard. Mm -hmm. Um for me, just today, I received word of two deaths of people that I know. So a dear friend's mother-in-law and another friend's mother. So this is something that is, you know, this is, you know, it's right here. You know, I'm, I'm living it as a, a person in the community. And I'm also participating, being out there on the front lines as a doctor who's caring for, for patients. So I'm, you know, I'm seeing it from that 360 degree perspective. And it's really something that we have to take very, very seriously. And not only those of us that are in the eye of the storm, but as we come through this, you know, looking at the next steps and then looking at the future. What do we want this to become? So as much as this is a crisis, it's always also an opportunity to think things through many, many steps down the road so that we will be better prepared for the next time and better yet, be able to prevent the next time. 100%, absolutely. Yes, indeed. And uh, because 
as we know, you know, there are treatments on the horizon, but uh, we don't have anything that's 100%, uh, you know, tried and tested. Yes, we are using, there are a couple of antibiotics that we're using, um, you know, the azithromycin and the hydrochloroquine. The pharmacies are already, um, uh, you know, kind of put the hammer down on and restrict who can get those prescriptions. So don't take, do take this seriously. Don't take it lightly. Um, remdesivir is still um, not, it's, it's not yet available for us. And um, again, just remember, because I'm seeing plenty of people without masks on. I saw two people uh, boxing yesterday morning. I don't know if they live together or not. A lot of people still aren't taking it seriously. Please take it seriously because there still is not um, a definite treatment for it and a vaccine is um, it probably won't be available until next year. So we're gonna head out. I'm gonna, and I'll start with myself. I'm Dr. Kadisha, your board certified emergency medicine physician, concierge physician, author, speaker, uh, author of the book, Help Us Help You in the Emergency Room. You can get it at www.helpushelpyoubook.com. And this time where ERs could be filling up, you wanna be best prepared for an ER visit. So, and Dr. Yeah, and I'm, I'm Dr. Dietrich Gorman. I'm a board certified family medicine physician. I'm also known as America's Relaxation Doctor, in which I help individuals who are, are having stress in the workplace. And, you know, people who are having to go to work now in this time of COVID are feeling extra stressed. Um, but I help them help release some of that stress in the workplace so they can live more healthy, productive, and fulfilled lives. I also have a best-selling book. I actually have two right now. I just came out with a coloring book as well as my regular book. You can find out all that information on my website at drdietrichg.com. That's D-R-D-E-I-T-R-I-C-K-G.com. And just take care of each other and take care of yourself. All right. And I'm Dr. Carol Penn, doubly board certified in family and obesity medicine and also your master movement meditation and mindset coach and author of best-selling book, Meditation in a Time of Madness, a guidebook for talented tweens, teens, their parents and guardians who need to thrive. Come and visit me over at my website, www www.drcarolpen.com that's d-r-c-a-r-o-l-p-e-n-n.com and really reduce your stress and come meditate with me in the mornings at 6 45 a.m eastern time on weekday mornings at dr carol pen on my facebook fan page so that's dr carol pen movement is my medicine and i'll see you tomorrow morning at 6 45. Okay, okay thank y'all Thanks so much. See you next time. Till next time. Okay, Til bye. Next time. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye.